This week we have a double parsha, two for the price of one, Nitzavim and Vayelach. Normally we have a double parsha, it means it's a longer portion. These are the two, respectively, the two shortest, fewest amount of verses in uh, all of Torah, out of all f- 54 parshios. Nitzavim is the shortest at 30, I'm sorry, Nitzavim is the second shortest at 40 verses, and Vayelach is the shortest at 30, a total of 70. And given that the average parsha has 108 verses... Uh, therefore, this uh, all told 70, we're still on the shorter end. Now, uh, these last few parshios are all happening in the last week of Moshe's life. Essentially, the whole book of Deuteronomy is within the last month of Moshe's life. And Deuteronomy is, is broken up to essentially three parts. You have the first few sections where Moshe is recounting the past. And then you have the middle sections where there's the bulk of the mitzvos. Many of them are repetitions. Many of them are new ones, mitzvahs that are going to be particularly relevant for them once they get to Israel. And then you have the last section where Moshe is looking very uh, forward-looking. And he's giving them exhortations. He's giving them warnings. He's giving them admonishment. And he's making prophecy about the future, what's going to happen, and about the choices that the Jewish nation is going to face. And last week, uh, in Parshish Hisavo, we had about the uh, what's called the tochacha or the admonishment which is Moshe puts it all very plainly and clearly. The Jewish nation, you're going to be faced with tremendous challenges. And if you choose Torah and you embrace mitzvos, good things will happen to you. You'll flourish in the land and you'll have peace and prosperity and stability and hegemony. Everything is going to be fantastic. Um, However, should you reject God or reject Torah, he lists what's going to happen. And it's interesting for us today to look back at it and find how prescient Moshe was, because we look at Jewish history, and we see it in Deuteronomy. Reflecting back, in this Parsha and the next, we're going to see, it's going to continue along the same theme. There's going to be a measure of of comfort, where Moshe is going to try to reel the Jews back in. Uh, The Jewish people were ashen when they heard all the descriptions of what's going to happen to them. Uh, And the Parsha begins, Atem Nitzavim, you're standing which is a way of saying, you're still standing. You're still here. After all that you've done, and after all that maybe you should have warranted, your behavior that should have warranted you to be destroyed, you're still here. And that's one of the themes of the Parsha, that no matter what the Jewish people do, we're never going to disappear as a nation, and we're never going to forget Torah. And those two are uh, one and the same. Uh, However, it's going to be a rocky road. And we know looking back at history, uh, how, uh, how true this, uh, this was. Now, it is interesting, just broadly speaking, the, if you remember all the way back in Leviticus, the last parsha of Leviticus, Bichu Kosai, uh, we also had a series of admonishments where Moshe tells the nation what's going to happen to them in the future, very bad things. And uh, last week's parsha, we have an even more expanded version. And the those the sages actually counted, and in the end of Leviticus, you have 49 curses, and in the end of, in last week's parsha, Kisavo, you have 98 curses, um, which is double, which is interesting. Um, but what is this need to have so many verses dedicated uh, to uh, to this idea of the Jewish people going astray and the consequences that result? So the Ramban in in Leviticus, he breaks it down to first temple and second temple. He says that the description of what happens to the Jewish people after they sin and the result of the sin that are described in Leviticus, that's referring to what happened at the destruction of the first temple, the hands of the Babylonians. And the descriptions of what we have over here in Deuteronomy, that's a result of what happened to the sins of the Jewish people leading up to the second temple, and uh, and the result of uh, of the de- destruction and the dispersal of the nation as a result of the second temple being destroyed by the Romans. So it's interesting, and we know the Talmud tells us the reasons why the Jewish people, uh, the sins the Jewish people had that led them towards the first temple being destroyed and the second temple being destroyed. First temple being the three biddies, the three cardinal sins. It was murder, it was idolatry, it was adultery. And that led that 
lower the spiritual status of the, uh, of the nation and made them vulnerable to attack from without. And the Babylonians came, destroyed the temple, destroyed Jerusalem, sent the bulk majority of the Jewish people in chains to Babylon. That comparatively wasn't as bad as what happened in the second temple. The second temple, we're told in the the sources, and we know historically, the Jewish people, they didn't abandon Torah per se. There wasn't rampant sin on such a degree, but there was infighting. There was disunity. There was uh, factionalism and sectarianism amongst the nation. And when someone is a sinner, there's something wrong. But when someone, when a unit, a cohesive unit is at war with each other, that's, that's even worse. And thus the result, right, it's the double amount of curses, and it's a lot longer to get back to Israel, you know, 70 years after the first temple is destroyed, Jewish, Jewish people are back in Israel, albeit not quite the same number and grandeur as before, but they're back. And how long did it take us to get back to Israel after the second temple being destroyed? It's uh, uh, more than a thousand years, 15, 1700 hundred years. With this, perhaps we could suggest that um, Jewish people have been described as one entity. Right? We said a few weeks ago that when someone scratches themselves and causes wounds and injury to themselves, that's an exact parallel of what it means when one Jew fights with another Jew. Because we're part of one unit, it's almost as if we're one body. Therefore, a body self-harming, it, it's, it's illogical uh, and it's destructive. And I think maybe we can even say a little further. Uh, there's this idea called an autoimmune disease, right? Where the body's fighting itself. Right? Sometimes you have uh, an infection or a virus. It's, it's from without. What's really nefarious, really dangerous, or really sad is when the body is fighting itself and causing self-harm. Perhaps we could say that, yes, there were great sins on the first temple that caused the first temple to be destroyed, but the Jewish people themselves, the body wasn't fighting itself. The nation wasn't fighting itself. And that is, it, it's something you have to deal with and it's difficult and it's painful, but it's manageable. When the body is fighting itself, when the nation is fighting itself, that shows that there's deep-seated corruption and that indeed results in a much harsher punishment and a much longer road to recovery. Uh, but the Jewish people are still standing and uh, Moshe tells them, uh, even though after all, all that you've heard, and we could talk about this today, we know the uh, collective uh, Jewish memory of, of all our, of our history, but we're still standing and we still have, uh, now we're back to Israel and we still have uh, a vibrant uh, community and that is a measure of comfort. And Moshe gathers the people together and he tells them, all you are standing here, your heads of, of the tribes, your elders, your officers, everyone, all, all the people are here, the, uh, the, the, the men, the women, the children, the converts, the water carriers, and the wood choppers. Who are these water carriers and wood choppers? So Rashi tells us that these are people who joined the nation. They, they, they were the, um, the ones who jumped in the bandwagon. And, uh, and there was a question as to whether or not their conversion was sincere or not. So Moshe actually accepted them, but he said, you guys are the water carriers and the wood choppers to kind of have them you know, at arm's length to just uh, inspect them to make sure that they are okay. And what is the meaning behind this congregation that we're getting together? We're going to have the final covenant uh, between the Jewish people and God, sealing the final treaty of what, what does it mean to be, to be part of this nation, what are the consequences, what are the benefits, and what's going to be the history uh, contingent upon the Jewish people's uh, behavior. And there's an amazing Rashi here, in verse 12. Verse 12 reads, In order to establish you today as a people to him, and he be a God to you as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This is a bilateral relationship. We accept God as our, as our king, as our master, and he accepts us as our nation. And that's a binding agreement. Says Rashi, God accepts us to not swap us out for a different nation, and as a result, therefore, he has to make sure that we stay the course. What this means is, to be God's nation, it doesn't just mean, it's not just this arbitrary idea that we're God's nation. It demands a certain code of conduct, certain behavior that is reflective of the fact that we're God's nation. 
And therefore, God says, I committed to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to you, to the people present, that I'm never going to swap you out for anyone else. But that necessarily mandates that you can't swap me for anyone else. And therefore, we're both in this, and there's no way to get out of it. Well, how do you make sure you don't get out of it? So Rashi, I think it's an incredible insight, and it's a theme that it's repeated again and again in these two parshios, that the fact that the Almighty is going to always nudge us back to the Course, back to God, back to Torah, and the more we veer away, the more severe that nudge, that elbow in the ribs is, that is exactly a direct result of the fact that there's no other option. We have to remain God's nation, and God cannot swap us out with anyone else. That's that's the agreement. That's the oath. That's the treaty. That's the covenant. And it's too late to change it. And therefore, that mandates everything that results and everything that we just uh, immediately discussed in in Deuteronomy. And Rashi also, um, on, in verse twelve, he he goes back to the beginning verse of the of the parsha, and he he says uh, that uh, you are all standing today. And he says the idea of a day is reflective of, of this relationship. You know, the day, sometimes it's cloudy, sometimes it's rainy. As we know in Houston, sometimes it's very, very rainy. And sometimes it's, but there's always an next, there's always tomorrow. So that there's going to be this waxing and waning ebb and flow of, of Jewish history. Sometimes it'll be very dark and very cloudy and very terror filled. But you know what? There's always going to be tomorrow, right? The Almighty is pledging. We're always going to be his nation. He's never going to swap us for anyone else. And come what may, that's going to stand. And uh, the, 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 the night will be very difficult. And the exile will be long and challenging. And we'll suffer persecution and mistreatment and marginalization. But the day will yet, the sun will yet rise. And uh, there will be a bright future and the future is also guaranteed. Now Moshe, in verse 13, 14, also says, okay, I'm talking to you, and we're making this agreement, and we're making this commitment, and this treaty, and this covenant between you and God, but you know who else we're talking to? Whoever is here today, and whoever is not here today. So a question people could say, well, listen, Abraham made an agreement with God. 2017, Houston, Texas. What does that do with me? Abraham made an agreement. Moshe made an agreement. They were at Sinai. I was born in 1986. What do I, what is, how am I ob- obligated to keep the deal of yesteryear? So here's, here's what Moshe tells him. He says, I'm not talking just to you to have this covenant and this, and this uh, oath. Whoever is here today, standing with us today before Hashem, and whoever is not here with us today. All future Jews are part of this agreement, whether they like it or not. Now, the obvious question is, oh, it's, uh, how is it possible to uh, to make an agreement that's binding for people that aren't there and can't refuse? So I see. I saw some of the commentators talk about that. I saw something interesting that Rabbeinu Bachia says. He says that he says two two answers to this question. I thought it was interesting. Says first of all, the root of the future is already present in the past. We know that your DNA you got from your parents. And where do they get it from? From their parents. And there's a little kernel that was pre- – a kernel of us today was present, you know, 3,289 years ago at this momentous occasion. So therefore, that's the right. Yes, we weren't there – in our consciousness, we weren't present that we couldn't renege on it. We couldn't. We couldn't reject it. But still, the forefathers have a power to make agreements because they are the roots of the future. An interesting idea. But another thing, it quotes from the Talmud that we know souls they predate bodies. Our bodies have a shelf life. They're here for seventy years, and they're comprised of earth because you put them in the earth, and it it could. Uh, it become earth after being present in earth for a little bit. But souls, well, souls have been around for a long time. And the Talmud even tells us that there is a vault in heaven uh, where all souls are sitting there waiting their turn. It's like you go to the bar, but take a number, right? Everyone's there sitting there waiting to have an experience of life. 
<clears throat> to be married with the body for 70, 80, 90, 100 years and have a meaningful experience, even though, to be perfectly honest, if you look at the sources, the souls are not actually that happy. They're not waiting. They're very happy where they are there, and they're very devastated when they get here. <laughs> the soul can exist outside of a body. Body cannot exist outside of a soul. Talmud says that if, uh, if you take uh, the meat, slab of meat out of the freezer, and you leave it in the heat, it's going to rot. Same exact thing. You take a body and you pull the soul out of it. If there's nothing to preserve it, it's gonna, it's, it has no life. Right? The fact that the, 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 the hardware, apps in the software, is useless. Right? That's what they call a, um, a bookend, right? If you, if you brick your phone, it's, it's very useful to hold down papers. That's it. Right? <laughs> so if a body, it doesn't have a soul in it, it's not very useful at all. It can hold the door open. Sure, but it has no life. The idea is that the soul can exist outside of a body, body can exist outside of a soul. So, the Talmud tells us that actually at this covenant, all the souls of the future actually were brought down here, and they were present. So even though they weren't alive with their body, they were alive with their soul, and our souls were there, and our souls opted in as well, and thus... Another answer to the question, how are we obligated? Well, we accept it upon ourselves. I, my body didn't accept, but you know what? My body today is a different body than it was seven years ago because your souls, your cells change. So what does it mean, right? The fact that your body makes an agreement, that itself doesn't matter because it's just the soul that stays and the body is just entirely changing every second. You're swapping out loads and loads of soul uh, cells and thus you're not even the same – you're not even the same – you have, no, you have the same composition physiologically. So how the agreement that I made seven years ago, what does it matter to me today? The answer is because the soul makes the agreement. Uh, the, the sources also mention, interestingly, that at Sinai, all future Jewish souls were also present and the souls of future converts. So that's the same idea. And that, that was the first agreement. And here's the second agreement. Second concretization, a follow-up agreement uh, of... Uh, of Nitzav and Vayelach and the end of Moshe's life. Moshe then gets into the content of what, what, what are we talking about here? What's this agreement about? What, what is the concern? What is the, what are we scared of? What's the danger? And Moshe tells him, verse 15, we lived in Egypt for a long time. And then the past 40 years, we've encountered many, many nations. And all of them are idolatrous nations. And you saw their abominations and their detestable idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold that were with them. Interestingly, Rashi points out, you saw their idols of wood and stone. But those are the ones they're not worried someone's going to steal and keep it outside. But the ones of silver and gold that were with them, they're those who are inside and hidden in the safe. Interestingly, uh, uh, the idea of an idol, which to us is unfathomable, but was very, very popular at the time. Uh, was this idea of spiritual power captured in a physical entity or absolute spiritual power captured in a physical entity. Uh, yet, if it's made out of gold, it can't defend itself. Right? You have to hide it inside. Uh, and perhaps, says Moshe, you, you, you encountered so many cultures that are obsessed with idolatry, maybe you too are going to follow or be interested in following it and rejecting God. That's the concern. Now, it is interesting that Moshe concedes that what you saw were abominations. And if you actually read this in Hebrew, uh, and their detestable idols, uh, the actual word in Hebrew is uh, a word that is the same word as excrement. There are idols that were like excrement. And the obvious question is, if everyone agrees that what they saw was abominable and detestable, what is the concern that they're going to follow? Why would we be even worried that the Jewish people would try to adopt this kind of detestable behavior? Moshe is telling them, listen, you encounter these civilizations, you encounter these cultures, you're about to head into a land, into a land where there's many nations that are all behaving like this. And it's abominable, and you know it's abominable, it's detestable, and you know it's detestable. But maybe you're interested in it. And the question is, of course, why? And... 
I think there's several answers. I think they're very powerful uh, answers that are relevant to us in our life as well. And the first is the idea of, of peer pressure. And that, yes, something may be improper or immoral or objectively detestable, and uh, that could be undeniable. Yes. But if everyone is doing it, and you feel like the outsider and the pariah, and you're stigmatized if you don't do it, you may capitulate. And this is not a result of a conscious decision, cogently weighing all the options, and trying to evaluate which one of them is more proper. The truth is that a lot of our behavior is governed not by rigorous evaluation of the merits of the behavior, but simply what other people do and what society does, and we just follow like sheep. And there is this idea that uh, it's, people don't want to go against the grain. It doesn't feel comfortable. They don't want to be judged. You're going to go into the land, and everyone's going to look at you like you're crazy. You don't want to adopt the idols. You're going to be, you're going to be stigmatized. Everyone's going to look down at you. Everyone's going to say you're so uncultured. You don't understand this. You don't get it. And that's a very powerful force. And yes, it's detestable and it's abominable. Sure. So what? Everyone's doing it. I don't want to be the one left out. Moshe's telling them, this is a real danger. And of course, if this is not relevant to idolatry, this is relevant to who knows what. It's very hard for someone to have the uh, the, the strength of character to say, I'm going to do what's right no matter how much ridicule I'm going to get. And that's a real danger. And it's and, and the merits are, are thrown out of the window. It doesn't even matter. The merits of the issue, does it, it's, it is abominable. So what? Right? We're vulnerable uh, because we're people who want to make – we want to make other people um, uh, look at us positively. And we want to be held in high esteem in other people and even people that are nuts. We want them to think good of us. That's one idea. Very powerful lesson. I think there's another idea and that is that um, – Standards, moral standards, but any sort of standards, uh, once they become violated, it becomes increasingly normal. I think this is there's a positive and there's a negative. We talk about uh, the the four minute mile that was broken in 1954. Till then, that, that that was the holy grail. That was the gold. No one could break the four minute mile, and then one guy does it, and before you know it, everyone does it, and that becomes the standard. And the idea is is that. Uh, there's a psychological barrier to doing something that's never been done. But once it's been done, everyone, okay, it can be done, then it, it can be done with relative ease. You know, the, that, the, the, the runners always talk about the four-minute mile or the 10-second barrier, running a 100-meter dash and doing it in 10 seconds. Once it was done once, it became more common. That's on the positive side, that once you see someone who could accomplish something great, in your head, a certain switch gets turned on, oh, I could do it as well. On the negative side, I think this applies as well. You know, uh, it, it, what was considered a huge scandal uh, 50 or 100 years ago is totally normal today. Uh, we talk about the indecent exposure. Right? What, what, what is tolerated in, in good society? Uh, what was yesterday deviant is today cool, it's, it's hip. Right? What was taboo of old, right? it's art, it's uh, free expression today. And, you know, the Jewish people, they're going to see the idolatry, and it's nauseating, and it's ab- abominable. And who would want to do that, right? But they've been, de- they've been desensitized. They are now calloused. And yes, it's nauseating, but the second time, it's kind of normal. And who knows, sometime down the line, it may become appealing. And, you know, we read uh, in the beginning of Numbers about the suspected adulteress, the Sota. And we quoted the Talmud as saying that when someone sees this all happening, you see the Sota big kill Kula in her disgrace, you right away have to make yourself into a Nazir to refrain from alcohol, from wine, for a minimum of 30 days. 
And the reason why is because wine leads to levity, leads to promiscuity. And you see someone who sinned in that arena, you got to guard yourself to make sure that you don't follow the same path. But it's interesting to note the verbiage of the Talmud, haroes sota bichilkula. If you see a sota in her disgrace, well, if you see the sota in her disgrace, then all the more so you wouldn't want to behave in the same way. That would, in fact, cause you to, you wouldn't need to make this vow of uh, abstinence from wine. Because you see the disgrace, you say, I don't want no part of this. But the answer is that, yes, you see the disgrace, but now there's this niggling force within you that says, oh, this is somewhat interesting. And it becomes weirdly appealing. So, yes, it is a disgrace, and you acknowledge it's a disgrace, but now you're desensitized to it. It's broken a barrier within you, and now it enters the realm of possibility for you. Guard yourself against that. And Moshe tells the people, maybe there's a man or a woman or a family or a tribe that their heart deviates today from God. They want to serve other gods, gods of other nations. Maybe there is a root for flourishing with gall and wormwood. There's corruption. And this person or this entity will say, I'll be okay. I'll be safe. It's not going to apply to me. I will, he will bless himself in his heart. I'm safe, right? Peace will be with me. Though as I walk, as my heart sees fits, I'm okay. I'm going to do whatever I want and I'll be fine. Thereby adding the water to pun thirsty. And Moshe goes on to say, Hashem is not going to forgive him. And there's no, you cannot hide. You cannot hide from God. Now there is a interesting line here at the end of verse 18. Thereby adding the water upon the thirsty. What does this mean? Very, very strange line. Uh, what it means is that even though this, even someone is is well watered, they still add thirst upon it. That's what um, that's what uh, the commentators say. There's an amazing sequence here in Ramban. Uh, Ramban he just he he talks about this idea of someone going towards the path of lust. And adding more water to the thirsty, which means you're increasing, you're fueling the fire when you think you're extinguishing it. And he quotes the Talmud about uh, a certain counterintuitive reality with regards to lust. The Talmud says that there's certain parts of one bo- one's body that don't operate the way they should. Normally you're hungry, your stomach is empty, you, f- you feed it. And it becomes full. You're not hungry anymore. You're thirsty. You quench the thirst. You address the need. And the need goes away. There's one part of someone's life that's the opposite. If you satiate it, you're hungry. If you starve it, you're satiated. And it's referring to uh, matters of lust. You know that there's uh, uh, the soldiers on the front, if they're actually on the front in the middle of the war, they could go six months without even thinking about uh, promiscuity or things like that. There's too much. There's pressing needs on their mind, and they're satiated, so to speak, with regards to those matters. And ironically, the more they are, the more they're starved, the more they're satiated. That's what the Ramban says. However, with when someone who imbibes in matters of lust, it actually has a ripple effect of demanding more and more. And that that satiation that you desire is actually uh, unobtainable. And he says something really interesting, that when a man desires things that are bad and they are able to fulfill those desires, they actually increase more and more lust. And they become thirsty for things that they weren't even desired desirous of prior and they become desirous of new things and he gives an example of someone who is lustful after uh, matters of promiscuity in a more I would say traditional way Uh, but if he continually 
immerses himself in these kinds of assumed pleasures, he goes off the path and starts seeking things that he would never be desire of himself prior because he can't get his fill. And you have to come up with newer and crazier and uh, more deviant uh, forms of promiscuity to to reach equilibrium. And then you think you're to equilibrium and then you need even more, which is an interesting idea that um, just how counterintuitive this this doesn't work as you would expect. Another – just a, um, another important insight that um, – with regards to the spiritual matters, you can actually obtain uh, what it is you're seeking and the good feeling persists, whereas with regards to all physical ple- pleasures divorced of a spiritual goal, that doesn't actually you – don't, you don't actually obtain the desire. Once you get what the assumed desire is, you just push the desire for – you kick the can further down the road. And someone like this says, Moshe, Hashem will not forgive him. Hashem's anger – will smite him, and all the curses that are said in the book will come down upon him. And when people looking back, there's an amazing verse in verse 21. The later generations will say, the, the, the children who will rise after them, the foreigner will come from a distant land, and they will see the plagues of the land and its illnesses with which Hashem has afflicted it, sulfur and salt, a conflagration of the entire land, it cannot be sown, it cannot sprout. They'll see such devastation, such carnage. And they'll ask, for what reason did Hashem do this to the land? Why this wrathfulness and great anger? And the answer will be, because they forsook the covenant of Hashem, the God of their forefathers, that he sealed with them, and they went and served other gods. <coughs> and this is Moshe telling what's going to happen in the future when people are going to look back in history. People look back in history and they see the devastation and destruction of the land, as we know very well, actually happened. It happened twice, uh, where the Jewish people were kicked out of Israel uh, with, with with terrible destruction uh, by the Romans and by the Babylonians. And the, the question they'll ask is, why did this happen? This sulfur and salt, this straight fire? And the answer is going to be because they forsook this covenant. And I'm telling you ahead of time, don't, don't be surprised. This is what's going to happen. Now, why sulfur and salt? I uh, saw so one of the commentaries points out that sulfur is highly flammable, right? How do you make gunpowder? It's made out of sulfur. And salt is highly inflammable. And these are opposites. And Moshe is telling them there's salt and the sulfur, right? There's going to be a conflagration. There's going to be great, mighty powers that are going to come against you. If you embrace the Torah, you'll be entirely fire resistant fire retardant you'll you'll be safe you'll be fine otherwise there's going to be a great conflagration a great explosion and you'll be very susceptible to the uh, attacks of those that want to harm you and the narrative will continue so god's anger flared up against the land and he brought upon them the entire curses that appear in this book and hashem removed them from upon their soil with anger with wrath And with great fury, and he cast them to another land as this very day. And the last verse of the chapter, the hidden sins are for Hashem, but the revealed are for us and our children to carry out the words of the Torah. It is interesting that uh, we see many, many parallels in Jewish history about um, times the Jewish people were subject to great fires, to great curses, and where the Jewish people were plucked from the land, from their land that they lived for a long time, and they experienced God's anger and God's wrath and God's fury and none of God's mercy. And there's going to be another verse later on in these parshios that say that God is Anochi Hastir Astir Panai. God says, "I will cover my face, and I'm not going to show any compassion." Uh, for so, for someone to uh, to question. Of future events or past events of Jewish history and wonder where was God? Here's the answer. God covered himself and God says that my anger, my fury, my wrath will be unleashed uh, pending uh, this kind of behavior. Um, Just a quick note. I don't want to get bogged down by this, but I'll share it here. Uh, There is a theory that uh, all, well, there is this accepted tradition that the Torah's prognostication of future events 
is precise, is accurate. And we see, we see there's a lot of predictions over here in Deuteronomy, and we know, looking back at history, that they've happened. Now, uh, how exactly to decipher the predictions of the Torah and to find out when they happened or how they happened, that's a great mystery, of course. We don't know, we can't predict the stock market with the Torah. Maybe we could, but we don't know how to. But there is this one theory that was developed that looks at the verses in the Torah and takes every verse and looks and compares it to one year, one corresponding year. Right? The Jewish calendar starts with Adam. And right now we're at the year 5,777 from Adam. And the entire Torah has 5,845 verses. So, so there, were, there was an experiment done of an experiment, or maybe this was... There is this idea that's a little bit secretive, and no one talks about this a lot. I'm telling it to you, but it's secretive. Don't tell it to anyone else. <laughs> no, we will. <laughs> <laughs> I, I trust the podcast listeners to follow suit, to, to behave as well. So there is this idea that every verse in the Torah corresponds to a year since Adam. So if you want, that's just this idea. If you actually look at this verse, this verse 27, and Hashem removed them from upon their soil with anger, with wrath, with great fury, and he cast them to another land as this very day, what year would this correspond to in history? Uh, And the year is 1939, when the greatest upheaval of the nation in our history and the greatest wrath and fury and great anger that we've ever experienced when that was unleashed. The idea of, of the Torah as being the guidebook for history is clearly evident here. And and the sensitivity that we have towards looking at the past and looking towards the future and understanding that the future is up to us to make and the future is, is it's in our hands, uh, that is the theme. Um, so that it's I don't want to get too bogged down with it. Now, if you'll notice, the verse 28, in every Chumash, there's a series of dots on 11 dots on the letters of Lanu Ulvanenu Ad. This we've seen several times in the Torah. There's dots, there's big letters, there's small letters. So it is, it is an interesting thing. But what is this uh, idea of the hidden is for God, but the revealed is for us? What this means is that Moshe is speaking to the whole nation. And he's telling them that the nation will suffer because of the behavior of the nation. And there's going to be someone, an individual, a family, a tribe, and they're going to start behaving in a bad way. And we're all going to suffer as a result. And the question is, well, how, how is that fair? How, how could I moderate the behavior of my neighbor, of my neighbor. I can change them. Why am I culpable for someone else's sins? And here, Moshe is telling them that the hidden sins of my neighbor, that's for God to worry about. That's not my responsibility. I can go into his bedroom or his basement and tell him how to behave. But the revealed sins, that is my responsibility. If I see someone else behaving in a way that's improper and I am quiet about it, I don't do anything about it, I'm complicit. If I'm complicit, I'm responsible. And here, the, 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 way, this, the, the way the Torah, the way the Talmud describes this idea is that we are uh, all guarantors for each other. Call right? Yisrael, are vim we all are guarantors. For each other. Someone else has a loan, right? I'm on the hook for it, right? Jewish people have behavior that they need to do and all Jews are on the hook for all other people's behaviors, which is why, by the way, interesting idea, uh, it has a halachic apl- applicability. Right? Every After Shabbos is over, I have to make havdalah. This is a ceremony i got to do uh, to depart from Shabbos. Well, what if I made havdalah already, but my neighbor didn't make havdalah? So generally the law is, if I have a responsibility and someone else has a responsibility, one person can fulfill, can do it in a public fashion and fulfill the need of someone else. So he, someone makes Kiddush on Shabbos. 
I I have to make Kiddush. My wife has to make Kiddush. I make Kiddush, but I include her. Well, what if I already made Kiddush? So my objective, my need has been fulfilled. But my wife has not yet made Kiddush, or my neighbor has not yet made Kiddush, or Havdalah. Can I make it for? Can I make? Can I make it and fulfill their obligation? The answer is yes. Why? Because when my neighbor has a mitzvah to fulfill, there's a little bit of it that I'm a guarantor on, so I'm really obligated to fulfill his mitzvah. So therefore, I can do as if I have a need to fulfill because I really, indeed, do in his need to fulfill. Chapter thirty begins the discussion of repentance. So Jewish people they sinned or they will sin. And they did idolatry, and they were sent out, and there's great fury. But now they are being uh, told, and Moshe's predicting, that after the curses, there's going to be repentance. You're going to return to Hashem, your God. You'll heed his, he, hearken to his words with all your heart, with all your soul. God will gather you in. You'll come back to Israel. If you're dispersed, will be at the other ends of the world. Eventually, there's going to be coming back together. And uh, he will return you to the land. You'll possess it. And Hashem your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring to love Hashem your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. This is, again, where the Torah says plainly, the Jewish people will be kicked out of Israel and they'll come back. We know historically it's happened only twice in the history of mankind, where a nation was expelled and exiled from the land, sent into uh, into exile, and yet came back and reestablished a uh, um, sovereignty over their land. It's happened only twice in history, both to the Jewish people. We were kicked out by the Babylonians, who we went to Babylon in chains, came back and reestablished hegemony over the land. We were dispersed by the Romans and eventually the Byzantines. And for 1,500 years, the land of Israel was basically desolate and empty. And you know what? There's 6 million Jews living back in Israel. Indeed, it's happened. It's pretty remarkable. And this is not a common occurrence. It's a very, very once-in-a-lifetime or once-in-history event. Actually happened twice, but both both times to our nation. Pretty remarkable. Now, what's this idea of the circumcision of the heart? Sounds like a very strange use of term. Um, and this is what repentance is. Repentance is circumcision of the heart. So I just want to just explain um, what, what this means. We know that we have a relationship with God. We could have a relationship with God. And but where does that relationship lie? Is it in our is it in our body or is it in our soul? And the answer is that our body, if you just isolate the body, the body is it's like animals have bodies, we have bodies. We're not distinct. And thus we kind of have this deep relationship with God vis-a-vis or with respect to our body. However, we're different than animals. We also have a soul. And the soul is like an angel. And the angel can have a relationship with God. And thus, in our capacity as a soul, we can have a relationship with God. And the only question is, how intimately connected are we with our soul because the more connected we are with our soul, the more connected we are with God. If there is a barrier between us and our soul, then by definition there's a barrier between, between us and God. What this means, the circumcision of the heart, the heart refers to our soul. The problem is our soul is covered. We have a Yetzar Hara, evil inclination, we have a body, And all those things makes us lose connection with our soul. And because we're not connected with our soul, our soul is an afterthought. Our soul is something that, yes, maybe we have, but it's not who we are. We don't identify as a soul. Well, therefore, we're not connected to God. And the more we behave in a way that is antithetical to what our soul wants, the more layers we add, so to speak, onto this foreskin of our soul – and the more muffled our relationship with our soul is, and thus the more cloudy our relationship with God is. And thus, when we talk about repentance, repentance is not necessarily achieving something that doesn't exist. It's getting something new, a, a new create relationship with God. The relationship is already there. It's clearing the path. It's removing the layers 
that are blocking us from our soul and thus us from God. And thus we are already at the destination. It's just we have to pull apart the wrappers that are covering up our soul and thus exposing and unearthing the soul that's latent. It's there and it's powerful and thus reconnecting with our true identity and thus with God, which is an, an interesting model. We think of spiritual accomplishments as something that we need to access from without. Like, we don't have them. We're, we're physical, we're base, and we have to try to get something that we don't have. That's the way, that's the model that we typically think. Here we're told that the heart is there, it's probably the soul is there, it's just covered. We have already everything we could even imagine. It's just buried within us. We have to unearth it. And we unearth it, and thus we return to our status as being a soul, and automatically, by default, we have our relationship with God. And that's going to be very instructive for what's going to come up here. So there's a series of verses here, beginning in verse 11. For this commandment that I command you today, it is not hidden from you, it is not distant. It is not in the heavens. If it was in the heavens, you would say, well, who could go to the heaven, climb up to the heaven and get it for us and we could perform it? It's not across the sea. Rather, the matter is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart to perform it. There is a mitzvah that Moshe is talking to the Jewish people about. And don't think it's so far. It's in the heavens. We have to go get it. It's across the sea. We have to go travel to get it. No, it's in our hearts. It's in our mouth to perform it. What, the, what what mitzvah is he talking about? So Rashi says that means talking about Torah. Study a study of Torah. Don't think Torah is so hard to access. You have to change who you are. No, it's it's within you. It's an interesting uh, line in Rashi. Rashi says that it's not in the heavens. If it was in the heavens, Ilu If it was in the heavens. You would have to climb to the heavens and get it. That's what it would be. What this means is, is that the Torah at its root is from the heavens. And you would think maybe it's still in the heavens. And maybe you have to climb up and, 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 and do what Moshe did. Moshe went up to the heaven to get the Torah. But Moshe is telling them, it's not in the heavens anymore. I brought it down. It's here. And therefore it's accessible. That's Rashi's understanding. The Ramban, he says this is not talking about the mitzvah of Torah. It's the mitzvah of tshuva, of repentance. The same mitzvah that he's talking about in the beginning of chapter 30. Repentance is not hard. It's not something that's really hard to go get. It's easy. Like Mark Twain said. Quitting smoking is the easiest thing I've ever done. I've done it thousands and thousands of times. <laughs> right? It's no, no big deal. It's really easy. And, of course, the problem is is that we know it's, it's really hard. To change who you are is very difficult. So how could it be that this mitzvah that we're told um, to do, and it's this, it's this end of the whole story, we, end of history mitzvah. We went through all this chaos and all these travels and, uh, and all these persecutions and all these exiles. And now, okay, we're coming back. We're coming back to Israel. We come back to God, come back to Torah, we're repenting. Right? The word for repentance in Hebrew means to return. We're returning to where we're supposed to be. It's so easy. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart to do it. Perhaps this is an extension of the idea of circumcision of the heart. We are already at the destination. That's a more natural state of being. And thus... All we need to do is to return to who we really are. The Talmud tells us uh, an example, an analogy. It says that there was a sailor on a ship. And uh, the sailor was there with the captain. And the sailor was thrown overboard into the very chaotic waters. And the sailor is going to drown. And the captain takes a lifeline and throws it to the sailor. And the sailor seizes onto the lifeline and the captain reels him in. 
And this is actually comes up in the mitzvah of tzitzis, right? Tzitzis, we know, are little streams. But they're streams that are symbolic of all of Torah and all of mitzvahs. And the Midrash tells us that the Almighty threw us in the water. He put us initially, right, with our soul, we're close to God. We're sailors who are next to the captain. But he threw us into the very choppy waters of this world, of having a body, of having a Yitzhahara, of having all these challenges. And we get deluded into thinking that this is a normal state of being, where you're, you may die any second. Your soul could die in this chaotic world. But the Messiah says, I'm going to throw you Torah, I'm going to throw you mitzvos. And you hold on to the mitzvos and he'll reel you when you come back to God. But what this is saying is that, yes, it, of course it's hard. But it's actually big picture. You think about what is a more natural state of being for the sailor. Is it safely aboard the ship or is it thrashing about in the water? Of course it's safely aboard the ship. We think part of what we th- – part of the corruption that the Sahara does to us is to make us think that thrashing about in the water is what we want and we don't want to go aboard. It's, it's incredible delusion. It thinks that being in a state where our soul is in peril, it could be killed. That's good. That's part of the reason why it's bad. But what the Torah is telling us is, yes, of course repentance is very hard. It is difficult. But if you think about it from the soul's perspective – it's actually very, very easy. It's very normal. It's very natural. It's a very appropriate state to be. It's where it was prior and where it hopes uh, through our choices we could get to in the future. A very um, st- a interesting model of how to think about it. We already have whatever, whatever it is that we need. We just need to protect it and unearth it. There's another teaching in the Talmud uh, about Rabbi Judah the prince, and Antoninus, his Roman counterpart. And long story short, the way they described life is that you have a you have a king who has an orchard and he has two guards in the orchard. And one guard is lame and the other guard is blind. And he says, okay, watch, watch over all the fruits till I come back. And the lame person, of course, cannot access the fruits. And the blind one can access, but together they can. Because the lame one, he takes a piggyback ride on the blind one. And they navigate and they're able to eat all the fruits. They're able to cause all the corruption. And then the king comes back and says, well, where's the fruits? I, can, I couldn't have done it. I'm lame. I couldn't have done it. I'm blind. And this is an example of the body and soul um, or the state of human, the way we are <clears throat> comprised and the corruption. But if you actually think about the picture – this orchard, this unsullied soul, that is already there. It's just that it's threatened. Right? We have to guard. It's about gu- guarding your safety. Your, your, your soul is already at the promised land when you're thrown in. The, the sailor is healthy when he's thrown into the water. It just – there's now a danger. And if you fend off the danger, if you remove, so to speak, what's inhibiting, then you are already there. You don't need to – actively access something, you just need to remove its detractors. And I think that's just a good way of, of, of looking at it. And Moshe, at the end of the first parasha, he recaps everything that he said. I'm giving you the, the life and the good and the death and the bad. What's the life? The mitzvahs that I'm commanding you, the Torah, you'll live and you'll be blessed. However, if you want to choose what's bad and what's death, you could adopt idolatry, follow foreign gods, and I'm pledging today, making it very clear, you will surely be destroyed, you won't have long life in the land, and the heaven and the earth be my witness, I'm giving you the the good and the bad, the life and death, and you shall choose life so you should live. Uh, Moshe is making it very clear and very binary. There's good, there's Torah, there's mitzvot, there's God. And that's life, and there's bad, it's sinning, it's rejecting Torah, it's rejecting God, it's idolatry. Choose life. Very simple. And if you do that, you'll have um, a long life on the land that Hashem is giving you to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Chapter 31, Moshe is now uh, at his final deathbed. 
though he's not withered in any way. He's 120 years old. I cannot go out and speak to God the way I was prior. I'm not going to cross the land. It's up to you. And this Parsha essentially is Moshe strengthening Joshua and preparing the nation for his eventual demise. It's interesting. Verse 2, uh, Moshe tells the nation, I cannot go out and come in. I don't have the free access to the heavens as I had prior. Well, Moshe is telling them, remember the Torah was in heaven? Now it's here. I spent the last 40 years with free access to heaven. For example, there was a question about the five daughters of Tzlavchad. We read about them in the book of Numbers. It's a question about inheritance. And Moshe didn't know the answer. And he just went to God and asked him. Moshe is saying, that's over. I'm going to die today. This is the last day of my life. And now the Torah is entirely here. And that demands that we be prepared for it. And he's telling them, now the halacha is here. Now the Torah is here. I'm going to I'm going to be God. You still have prophets. You still have Joshua. You still have the elders. You still have a lot of things. But you're not going to have me. And therefore, he's preparing them and he's giving them the charge of, uh, of responsibility uh, now that he is going to go away. Be strong. Be brave. Don't be steered. Don't worry about who you're going to encounter. Hashem is not going to forsake you. He's not going to abandon you. And Moshe calls Joshua. And he strengthens him. He gives him support. The Almighty is going to be with you like he was with me. You're going to uh, conquer the land and you're going to inherit it. And you're going to settle it. He's not, the Almighty is not going to abandon you. Verse 9, important. Moshe writes down the entire Torah. And he gives it to the Kohanites, Levites. And they are the ones that are holding the ark. And to the elders. Moshe writes down the Torah and then he's going to tell them a little bit later on the Parsha to put it inside his edition of the Torah, write it inside, place it inside the Ark for posterity. We know historically, whenever the Jewish people needed to copy a Torah scroll, they would go to the one that Moshe wrote at the end, tail end of his life, and they would use it as uh, as a guidebook to make sure that there's no inaccuracies in their text. And then there's the Mitzvah of Hakel. The Mitzvah of Hakel is every seven years... The entire nation gathers at the uh, the year after the Shemitah on Sukkot, and they read the entire book of Deuteronomy. The king of the nation reads the entire book of Deuteronomy to the whole people. And who's there? Moshe tells them at the end of seven years at the Shemitah on the Chag Sukkos on Sukkot. Everyone comes, the men, the women, and the children, and the converts. Everyone who everyone has to be there and hear this message. To remind them about everything we've talked about in Deuteronomy. Now, why do you bring the kids? So Rashi says, importantly, you bring the kids to give reward to those who bring them. Par- parents come to listen. Children are there so that, you know, so that they could, they could give merit to those who bring them. That's what Rashi says. But I think simply put, the reason why the children are, are, are brought them is the same reason why you bring kids to the game. You go to the game, you always see these little kids with these, like, one-year-olds who, they don't know what a, what a ball is, much less the rules, the intricate rules of the sport, but they have a little micro, a little onesie t- uh, jersey, and uh, they put on them those those earmuffs, those earphones, so that they don't injure their little, precious little ears. And the question is, why would a parent do that? And the answer is, you want, you want to get them in young. Right? They yeah. join the family tradition, right? We've been Red Sox fans. For a hundred years, and don't you dare like the Yankees, right? Uh, and that's the way it is, you know. And if something as trivial as sports, you want to get your kids to be part of it, of course, the Jewish nation at this momentous gathering with everyone that's together, we want the kids to be part of it. I was uh, interestingly, I spoke to someone yesterday. Um, uh, he's a uh, he's born in Houston, but he's a diehard Boston sports fan. And I was ribbing him about the fact the Patriots lost the first game. So uh, he, so I said, are you a, like a Boston sportsman all across? Says, My father trained me well. Right away, made sure we're all Boston sports fans. All right. So I was thinking like, his father trained him well, right, to be into sports or to be into Boston sports, right? What are we training our children well? From the very beginning, they're little kids. 
We're bringing him to the hot cow. Bringing this to tremendous gathering of the nation. Everyone gets together. Everyone's here. Here's, here's the books of Deuteronomy. Everyone remembers and re- has a touch point with all these powerful lessons together with the entire nation. Moshe is about to die. He calls uh, uh, he calls Joshua. They go speak to God, and Moshe tells uh, Joshua, "You should know that the people are going to deviate away from Torah, and this is uh, it's going to happen." And uh, finally, Moshe prepares them by telling them we're going to have this song. And the song is a little microcosm, a little encapsulation of everything that we spoke about in Deuteronomy, all the predictions of the future. And it's a little, uh, it's going to be Neshri's Parsha Ha'azinu, which is a song. You'll notice even in the way it's the, the, the lines, the paragraphs are set up, it's, it's in, in a, in a uh, form of, of poetry. And Moshe uh, tells in verse 21, even though bad things will happen to the nation, uh, they'll have this song and the Torah will not be forgotten for the entire people. Again, the theme that even though the Jewish people will suffer and they will just go astray and they will deviate, but they'll never forget Torah and they'll never lose their character as a nation. Moshe tells finally the Jewish people, uh, tells, tells uh, Joshua, I know that after I die, the Jewish people are going to deviate. Rashi points out the Jewish people did not deviate uh, for the duration of Joshua's life. So how can Moshe say after I die? Says Rashi. Well, the teacher loves his students so much, and thus he considers the fact that Joshua is alive as if he's still alive. And therefore, until I die, until Joshua dies, uh, the Jewish people are never going to forget the Torah. And finally, Moshe speaks in the ears of all of Israel. Uh, Moshe tells, conveys to the Jewish nation the words of this song until their completion. We're going to read next week. What is this song? What is this description of Jewish history, uh, both good and bad, uh, and the waxing and waning and the terrible lows, but the momentous highs of our history. We'll look at that, hopefully, God willing, next week.